Grace, can you see the slide? Yeah, I can see the slide, but I can also see the notes. Oh. In the maybe presenter mode. Like you can see the presenter notes? Yeah. How about now? Yeah, that looks good. Welcome to those of you that are joining us. We're going to get started in a few minutes. In the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Just make sure you select everyone when you're using the chat function. And we just have this housekeeping slide up with a few things to remember. So your cameras and mi microphones are disabled. Please use the chat function for any questions, comments, or support. You can also use the Q&A function for questions. Um, 
and there will be 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you're participating today to receive CME or CU credit, you'll need to attend for 45 minutes or more to receive your certificate. And all participants who would like to receive credit will need to complete the evaluation survey after the session, which will be placed in the chat for you. And we will also follow up and send it to you via email. And CME and CU certificates will be sent out by March 29th, along with a link to the recording for today's session, the slides, and a list of related resources. And all those materials will also be put up on our website next week in the BHIP Mental Health Crisis Training Archive. Hi, how are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. I'm going to stop sharing real quick to make sure you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay. I am noticing it doesn't look like polls are enabled for this. Uh, Let um, me... I can. I was hoping to share this screen. I only have sort of the slides moving around. Oh, awesome. Good. Yep. I'm going to try to see if I can. Thank you. I have polls on my end. Oh, interesting. Oh. If you have them up, if you want to chat me them, I can enter them on my end. Um, I, they're stored in zoom, so I don't even know how to dig them out while I'm, while I'm in here. You know, I will be okay without them. I think it was just something I thought might be a little bit. Yeah. I wonder if I can make you, I can make you the host. If that works. I'm hoping that doesn't stop the recording. Let's see if that happens. <laughs> 
stop sharing to phone. Um, here we go. Let's see. Oh no. Know why it's not letting me load them from the website i made it like within the zoom ecosystem and everything but um well it may have been this sort of thing oh since we're like a webinar instead of like a regular zoom meeting that maybe that's oh yeah okay well another time perhaps okay all right it looks like it's 12 o'clock, so we are going to get started. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lily Stavisky, and I'm the Outreach and Training Coordinator for BHIP, and I will be introducing our presenter for today and facilitating the Q&A at the end of the session. For those of you that are unfamiliar with BHIP, I'd like to just provide some information about our program. So Maryland Behavioral Health Integration and Pediatric Primary Care, or BHIP, is a child psychiatry access program that supports the ability of pediatric primary care providers and emergency medicine professionals to address and manage mental health concerns. And BHIP is a free statewide program that offers telephone consultation, resource and referral networking, telemental health services, and some training and educational opportunities. And the BHIP warm line is staffed by a team of child mental health specialists and is available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m and we will put our phone number and our website in the chat for you. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's BHIP Mental Health Crisis Training, Assessment of Self-Injury and Suicidal Thoughts, presented by Dr. Hal Kronsberg. Dr. Kronsberg is a former seventh grade public school teacher and is an assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Kronsberg's clinical, educational, and research interests focus on providing mental health care outside of the traditional clinical setting. And he is a child and adolescent psychiatrist that serves on the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center's school-based mental health program and the child mobile treatment team. And in addition to clinical care and research, Dr. Kronsberg is also highly involved in clinical education and he is the program director for the Johns Hopkins Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship. We are very grateful to have you here today, Dr. Kronsberg. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us during this session. And I will hand it over to you. Right. Thank you, Lily. And, and, and thank you all for having me today. There's like a lot of material and I do want to make sure that we have some time for questions. So I'm just going to dive right in and get started. We're going to be talking about self-injury and uh, suicide, how to assess them and kind of what to do when you encounter kids who uh, have experienced these things recently. Um, so I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'm on the faculty at Johns Hopkins. BHIP gets its funding through HRSA. And we can kind of split up learning objectives into two kind of distinct groups, one around uh, addressing suicidality, where we want to talk about risk and protective factors for pediatric suicide, um, learn more about suicide screening and also how to conduct a thorough safety assessment. And then with regards to self-harm, to talk about the conditions and characteristics that are associated with self-injury, uh, identifying risk factors when it's associated with suicide, and knowing how to ask about self-injury and to understand its function and get a sense of its dangerousness. So I want to start specifically, though, by talking about suicide. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of demographic and risk factors that I think are important. The purpose of reviewing risk factors is to kind of give us a sense of who we should be worried about when kids uh, come to us either in the office, present to the ER, um, or uh, just we otherwise encounter in some other capacity. I think maybe age is the most uh, unappreciated consideration when evaluating kids in crisis. And uh, that's because we see this huge increase in uh, suicidal ideation plans and attempts that really starts around the age of 12. And so while it's definitely possible that a very young child is having suicidal thoughts, I often think among, among much younger kids, what we're often seeing is escape behavior and, and not necessarily true suicidality. Because in fact, many younger kids don't really even understand the concept of suicide. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but it happens much, much, much less frequently. Of course, we always wanna take it seriously, but we should always wonder, you know, what, beha what behavior is being reinforced uh, when we're meeting with a kid who's sharing suicidality as well. <clears throat> 
There are also specific risk factors besides age that we should consider. So unfortunately, the uh, polls, I couldn't load uh, through the workshop format, but I was going to ask about what conditions do we commonly associate with uh, uh, completed suicide. And so this is from a study that looked at uh, a huge portion of kids um, age 10 to 18. And there was a number of things that, that we noticed. First of all, more mental health visits within 30 days seem to um, decrease the odds of suicide. So being in treatment is associated with a decreased risk. Um, and suicide was associated with a number of different uh, psychiatric conditions. Um, however, uh, interestingly, the highest odds ratio were for seizure disorders, then depression, then psychosis, and then substance use disorders. And interestingly, adjustment disorders put kids at a higher risk for suicide than anxiety disorders, which tells us a lot about the role of kind of circumstance in uh, leading to suicidal thoughts, ideation, and completed suicides. There are a number of other risk factors too. Um, I put uh, two of these items in bold because they're really more related to circumstance. So being bullied is associated with suicide and also um, experiencing a recent uh, life stressor as well. One idea that I'll keep coming back to is often uh, suicidal thoughts are associated with a crisis rather than a more kind of static state of being that would be associated with something like a depressive disorder. We do know that kids who have attempted suicide in the past are at a much higher uh, risk for uh, dying by suicide and access to lethal means is especially significant and more often utilized um, in men and boys as well. So risk factors really only tell us a small part of the story and many adolescents who attempt suicide do so without a history of psychiatric illness as well. So the question is how do we catch these kids um, uh, about whom uh, it's not immediately obvious that we should be worried. And so there are a couple of like major institutions that have weighed in about suicide screening specifically. Um, so one of them is uh, the U.S. Preventative Task Force Service. So in 2016, uh, they put out a big paper that uh, said that they do not recommend uh, routine suicide screening uh, for suicidality and uh, due to lack of evidence. And then in 2022, the U.S. Preventative Task Force uh, concluded that the current evidence remains insufficient to balance risks and harms as well. So uh, just in summary uh, of their recommendations, they do recommend, for instance, at all pediatric visits, uh, screening for depression, but that wasn't their recommendation uh, around uh, suicide screening as well. As a contrast, the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2022 released the blueprint for youth suicide prevention, and they actually did recommend um, all kids 12 and older, again, because they're at greater risk than younger kids, um, uh, uh, get a validated suicide uh, screen during uh, regular health visits as well. So there's a lot of debate around what is the, the right sort of choice, the right move to make. And so um, what I'm not going to do is say what I think folks should do one way or the other, but I do want to share probably the most useful screening tool if that is what you do opt to do. So there are pros and cons of using screening tools. Um, you know, if there wasn't, then there wouldn't be uh, sort of a difference of opinion between uh, the uh, Preventative Task Force Service and the American Academy of Pediatrics. But I think one question is, you know, why do we bother conducting a suicide screen if a kid screens uh, negative for depression? Um, in pediatrics visits um, and in many ER visits, uh, kids get what's called the, the PHQ-9, which is the best screener for depressive disorder. Um, however, in the largest study in pediatric primary care, it turned out that about 10% uh, of kids were positive on the suicide screen. And of those kids, half of them didn't meet the threshold of screen positive for depression. Um, so really, the, the, I think the lesson here is that in many cases, suicidal thoughts are more kind of a transitory state in response to a crisis, whereas major depressive disorder can be thought of almost a more static state, basically. And so that's where screening can be helpful to capture those kids who aren't depressed, but still having suicidal thoughts. So the screener that um, I've grown to be most familiar with, and, and ultimately, if there's any screener that we use, I think is worth making use of, is something called the ASQ, or the Ask Suicide Screening Questions, which honestly, not a great acronym. They should probably workshop that. But um, the reason that I find this uh, pretty useful, it's incredibly brief. It's a five-question suicide screener. 
Um, it's meant specifically for use in pediatric primary care settings, but it's been validated in the ED. And um, I do believe that at some point it's going to wind up being validated for use in schools as well. Uh, it's totally free to use. It's not proprietary. Here you can see on the link, um, uh, and you could just easily Google NIMH uh, ASQ, and it'll take you to the page where you can uh, find uh, the, the toolkit. So it's not just a screener. It's really meant to help you with the entire process of screening and then evaluating and potentially referring kids uh, who have suicidal thoughts. So this is like a hideous slide, but just to give you a sense, um, you can look this up on your own, but this image that's over on the left is the suicide risk screening pathway. And so the idea is if you do have a kid that screens positive, you wanna know what to do next. And so that's where the ASQ is helpful. Positive screens are meant to have a much more comprehensive evaluation that follows that, including something called a brief suicide safety assessment. And it, by the end of this process, you should be able to divide patients into three risk groups. One is low risk. The other requires kind of further evaluation and thinking. And the other is immediate risk needs to go to either the emergency room or have a, an emergent uh, psychiatric evaluation. So here on the right is the what the brief suicide safety assessment looks like. So for kids who do screen positive, um, the next step is to do a more thorough assessment. The safety assessment is a four page document. It includes a risk assessment, safety planning and disposition planning as well. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail just because this is something that's free to everybody and anybody can uh, look it up, but I do wanna make sure that it's on people's radar. There are pros and cons of using the ASQ. The first is that it takes very little time to administer. As I mentioned, it's a much larger toolkit and it has really high sensitivity and specificity. Um, that is, there are very few kids who are having suicidal thoughts that would fall through the cracks by utilizing um, this screening uh, mesh method. The downside though, is there's a fairly low positive predictive value. And so that means 30% of the people who screen positive um, don't actually turn out to be true positives once you go through the full assessment. And the reason for that is, is one of the questions is, have you ever had, um, have you ever attempted suicide? So some kids um, will screen positive there um, and then you wind up having to go through the whole evalu evaluation. And the reason for that is because those kids are kind of innately at higher risk uh, as a result of their past behavior. Um, I will say, you know, some kids have found the language to be a little bit uh, jarring to be used as a screener for all kids. Um, and uh, likely it's not appropriate for really young children who still don't really understand the, the concept of uh, suicide in general. So the question is, you know, okay, you have a positive screening. There, you can go through the brief suicide safety assessment, but what I wanna do is to talk a little bit about how we assess suicidality um, within the course of a clinical interview. Um, as I mentioned, a positive screen or suspicion of suicide from a brief conversation is not enough. The next step is to figure out, okay, what do I do next? And in order to do that, we really need to nail down the specifics of suicide, suicidal ideation. So I'll walk you all through the approach that, that I take, at least when I'm asking about suicide, to try to get as full a picture as possible. But the first question that I ask is broad and open-ended and meant to be part of a conversation. And I'll start with, over the last month, how have you been feeling about being alive? Um, and I like using that question because uh, there's lots of different answers that can come. Uh, and so I like to start where the kid kind of lets me start. The follow-up questions get more and more specific and kind of gently move up to a higher level of acuity and specificity. So if a kid says, well, you know, I haven't been feeling that great about it, the next question would be, have there been moments where you wished you were dead? Um, and if the answer is no, then I think we can feel comfortable. Okay, this is, uh, you know, hasn't reached uh, a level of suicidal ideation yet, but someone who's really kind of struggling in general with being alive on planet Earth right now. Um, However, if the answer is yes, then I want to know, okay, well, let's keep going to a higher and higher level of acuity. Did you ever reach a point where you had a thought about actively trying to end your life, which is different from like wishing that you could go to sleep and not wake up? And eventually you keep asking with greater specificity. And if there's a specific thought to commit suicide, I'll follow it up again and again with about uh, the plan's details, including lethality, feasibility, and the desire to act on it too. I think feasibility is really important because there are kids who may say, well, I've been thinking about shooting myself. The next question should be, well, 
where would you get a gun from? And they may say, oh, I have no idea. I don't have a gun. I don't know anybody with a gun. It's just something that I've been thinking about. That's really different than, um, well, I'll just, you know, my dad has one locked up and I think I probably know the combination to get into the to the safe. Um, it's not just the, the plan, it's to what extent can this plan be acted on, I think. And so again, we just want to be really curious and try to picture in our mind what it might look like if our kid were to follow through on some of their thoughts. We want to also ask about frequency, intensity, and how you manage those thoughts when they come. A reality is some kids do experience kind of chronic suicidal thoughts, but also manage it really, really well. They know who they can talk to, or they feel like, yeah, I think about this a lot. I've never acted on it. I have no intention of acting on it whatsoever. That's really different from a kid who's experiencing it maybe for the first time um, and says, I don't know what my plan is. I'm really struggling. My plan is right now telling you. Um, that's, a, that's a really sort of different story that we also want to ask about who else knows. I'm very wary of being a secret keeper. Um, and then we ask about protective factors. And a, a simple way to get at that is, what's kept you from acting on this plan so far? You're telling me for a reason. What is the reason that you're telling me right now? And then I think we also need to be thinking about, you know, to what extent uh, parents and caregivers can provide supervision. Um, because when we start thinking about safety planning, um, safety planning doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists within the context of home and also in cooperation with parents, teachers, with, with other people that are in our kid's life. So at the end of our assessment, we should know, has our patient had thoughts of wanting to be dead? Have they had thoughts of committing suicide? How frequently? How intense? Do they have a specific plan? What would they do? Is that plan feasible? And what's kept them from acting on that plan? And then finally, um, are parents able to provide additional supervision? A parent who can be around their kid 24 seven is um, much uh, easier to safety plan with than a parent who is never around. And so it's really important for us to get a sense of what the home environment is like too. So there's a big question um, that we need to ask ourselves, and that is, does our patient feel that they can keep from seriously harming themselves with appropriate supervision and do parents and caregivers feel that they can provide adequate supervision to keep their child safe? That's like the big question. If the answer is yes, and there's still suicidal thoughts though, we can engage in safety planning. And it, uh, sort of at the tail end of this, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, uh, evidence-based safety plan that we make use of all the time in our emergency room and our outpatient visits um, all over the place. And it's something that I recently taught to uh, folks in Baltimore County uh, public schools as well. Um, and one in, a critical thing, though, is after you do the safety plan, it's worth saying, OK, just so we're all clear, are we comfortable with this plan? Um, and if the answer is yes, then absolutely everybody can go home with ideally plan for following up with a, a mental health provider. If the answer is no, then further evaluation is needed. So that can be um, an emergent psychiatric evaluation in the ED or another setting. So. Many times when we screen kids for suicide, we'll encounter those who may not express suicidality, but do present to us having uh, recently self-harmed. And in some ways, I think it's these kids who exist within these gray areas that are kind of the hardest to assess and plan uh, and plan with, since the next step isn't always so obvious. And that's one of the reasons why I want to go into a little bit greater detail around um, non-suicidal self-injury and kind of the approach that we should take in understanding the behavior um, and also kind of getting a sense of how dangerous it is. So um, a couple of definitions for self-harm that I want to use. Um, so sometimes it's referred to as NSSI or non-suicidal self-injury. Uh, this is kind of deliberate inducement of pain or tissue damage without suicidal intent, but oftentimes I'll be referring to uh, usually cutting, at times scratching though too. But I think one of the important things to think about self-harm is to see it as a behavior. Um, you know, a, a diagnosis is kind of an endpoint in our evaluation um, or investigation. Self-harm is often where our investigation has to begin. Um, because it's not really a treatable disorder in and of itself. There was um, an effort made to call, I can't even remember what it was, but like a, a disorder centered around self-harm as a, a, a psychiatric diagnosis in and of itself. But they turned out to be uh, kids who engage in self-harm are so different from one another. It didn't make sense to kind of group them together. However, self-harm often does signal the presence of other disorders. 
Um, another reason to see it as behavior is there is a reason why kids self-harm. There's something that is reinforcing about it that allows that behavior to persist. A thing I tell all the kids I work with and parents um, as well is no kids self-harm because they're crazy. It's doing something for them. And we need to figure out what that is. And as a result, in order to stop it, we need to address the antecedents and consequences as well. So I do think it's useful to talk a little bit about prevalence risk factors and characteristics of self-harm. Um, the reason being is because I think we have sort of wildly different ideas of how frequently it occurs um, and, uh, and how often kids who engage in self-harm do self-harm. So first of all, it's pretty common. Lifetime prevalence of self-harm with at least one instance is around uh, 23%. Um, here you can see that uh, females are uh, significantly more likely than males to self-harm, much like the emergence of depressive disorders and suicidality. The first instance is around uh, 13 years of age. Uh, most kids uh, or the, the sort of plurality of kids will self-harm maybe once or twice. Um, however, it's a much smaller portion of kids that will engage in self-harm more than 10 times over the course of their lives. In some ways, those are the kids that tend to uh, stir up the most feelings from the folks that are evaluating them. It does seem increasingly like rates uh, have been on the rise since 1990. I think there's a lot of speculation about that, but uh, certainly um, learning about it on the internet, I think is definitely a contributing factor to it. A lot of kids, it wouldn't occur to them. Um, and then they try it once and they find that it actually works for them in some way. Um, so I, it, it's clear as more kids are aware of it, more kids are engaging in it. So I think this slide is useful, mostly because it's a study of kids who are psych psychiatrically hospitalized to engage in self-harm. Um, and so in general, these kids um, have a greater severity of illness than kids who uh, we see in kind of more community samples. Um, however, the purpose here isn't uh, to use the numbers to kind of like uh, guide us as much as it is to see how self-harm is associated with many, many different conditions. Um, so it's associated with depression in about 50% of cases, PTSD in 40% of cases, marijuana use disorder in 30% of cases. It's a really, it's associated with a hugely heterogeneous uh, set of conditions. However, we do know that um, there are high rates of trauma. And in general, I think uh, we can think about uh, kids who struggle with like conduct disorder, opposition to defiance disorder, substance use disorders. These are kids who are fundamentally struggling with self-regulation. Um, they have a really hard time kind of managing their feelings. Um, and there'll be more on that in a little bit. Um, just a couple of things that, that I did want to share that do relate to this. Um, kids who do engage in self-harm are at higher rates of uh, going on to attempt suicide. And in particular, kids who are experiencing depressive symptoms, who, uh, who also engage in self-harm concurrently, they're at significantly higher risk of self-harm too. So if you think about it, a kid who's already at baseline struggling with self-regulation, their mood is significantly lower. And we know about adolescent depression that oftentimes um, it can be associated too with a dramatic increase of in irritability. You take a really irritable kid who thinks really negatively about themselves in a depressive episode, and at baseline, they already struggle with emotion regulation. Those are kids who are at high risk for suicide. So I think the question that's really important though, and this is not just important for clinicians, but also for parents is why do kids self-harm? And I think it's helpful to think about uh, it being a combination of four different outcomes. So uh, this uh, researcher, Matt Nock, is, um, uh, does a lot of work around self-injury. And uh, he basically describes four distinct outcomes uh, that are associated with self-harm. Kids might self-harm to increase in a desired feeling. Um, so an example of that are kids who feel like they are punishing themselves or stimulating themselves. Uh, there is a hypothesis that it's associated with an endorphin release. Um, uh, in particular, uh, what we call like endogenous opioids are released with self-harm. And that was why for a long time, people thought that if you took a medication that would block the opiate receptors, that might lead to a decrease in self-harm. It's been 20 years, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, though, that that medication doesn't really work. Um, but that is a hypothesis, that when kids engage in self-harm, they feel something that they want to feel. 
Another example is kids may engage in self-harm to decrease in undesired feelings. Um, often they'll say, you know, I was feeling overwhelmed and so I cut and then I didn't feel as overwhelmed anymore. In particular, it's meant to decrease sadness or anger or reduce a really unpleasant feeling of emptiness or numbness that many kids who engage in self-harm uh, express that they're trying to get away from. There are times in which self-harm is uh, associated with an increase in a desired social response, such as gaining attention or support. I think many people who really don't understand self-harm that well will say, oh, you know, it's all for attention or it's to quote unquote manipulate something. Um, and then another example is uh, to decrease an undesired social response, such as to end bullying or to stop parental fighting. Um, one of the studies that Matt Nock did that I thought was really interesting was he gave kids who engage in self-harm a pager and would basically uh, page them randomly throughout the day. And doing that helped him to understand uh, about how frequently kids were engaging in self-harm for these reasons. And if I had a poll, I'd ask you guys to, to weigh in to see what you thought. Um, but so it turned out about a quarter of kids um, report engaging in self-harm to increase a desired feeling. However, the vast majority were trying to decrease an unpleasant feeling, fe unpleasant feeling, in particular anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, escaping sadness, anger, or to escape a bad thought or bad memory. Um, using self-harm to uh, respond to an, or to either prevent or increase a particular interpersonal outcome is much less common. And I think that's a really important thing for parents to be aware of too. So how do we ask about it? How do we get a sense of how worried we should be? Because again, self-harm can be associated with uh, suicidality. And many times uh, that is a reason why kids may present to the emergency room, they may present to a uh, school guidance counselor's office, or they may present to the PCP. Is parents say, I found out my kid was cutting, what do I do? So there are some like principles that I think are really important. And again, we often wanna think about how we're reinforcing these behaviors. So the first is to respond with supportive concern. We're not freaking out, but we're also not ignoring it. We're curious. Um, uh, we wanna talk about confidentiality rules um, with, the, with, our, with the kids that we're talking to too. Um, and I think it's really important to give yourself some wiggle room too, because when we're in that gray area where it's not really clear that, um, you know, if a kid tells, tells me that they cut themselves four years ago or something like that, and they haven't had thoughts about self-harm, like I'm not telling their parents about that. I don't see why that's something that would necessitate my violating uh, confidentiality. However, there are circumstances where I would want to tell parents though. And so that's where I think um, it's important to review kind of what's okay, what needs to be shared with parents. Um, and also what you're going to do when you're in that sort of gray area. I never surprise uh, the kids uh, by telling uh, their parents without them knowing about it. And oftentimes I'll have a conversation that's like, okay, I got to tell your parents about this. Let's talk about how we should do that, though, and what's going to be the most helpful way to do that. Um, I think keeping the four outcomes model in mind is really useful. Again, I'm trying to figure out, is a kid trying to create a feeling, relieve a feeling, create a social outcome or prevent a social outcome? And then finally, safety first. We know it's associated with suicidal thoughts. So I also wanna make sure that I ask about suicidality um, as part of this conversation. So when I'm asking about cutting, I'll start with when did it start? How did you self-harm? Um, how do you self-harm also? Um, cutting, burning, scratching. There's so many different ways to do that. And I think that's a useful question to ask uh, because I do find that kids who engage in multiple different methods of self-harm are doing it because it doesn't work that well. Um, I also want to know how often um, and where is, I think, a really important question. Um, kids who self-harm in places that are very, very kind of obvious and apparent um, are also using it to communicate in some way. That doesn't mean that's the only way that they're doing it. Um, but if they know somebody is going to see it, uh, then there's some message that they want or they hope that person who sees it is going to, to get. Um, however, there are other kids who are really, really good at hiding it and who have gone years uh, self-harming, in some cases very severely, without anybody knowing about it. That's serving a very different purpose, I think. I'll also ask to see scars. Again, this is where supportive concern. Um, I'm, I'm Because I'm curious, you know, do the stories that I am hearing match with the sort of degree of tissue damage that I'm seeing? I've seen a lot of kids talk about uh, self-harming um, 
And then the scars are really, really minimal. And I find that I'm significantly less worried. And I've seen kids speak about it very sort of offhandedly like, oh, it's not a big deal. And then you see the scars and, and you see, oh, it's actually quite worse than, than the story that I'm getting. I also wanna know about who knows and how those people feel about it. Honestly, in, in part, because um, I think that other people are often one of the strongest motivators for kids to stop self-harming. Um, and, uh, and I also always wanna know, what do your parents know about your self-injury? Because I am not here to keep secrets. That's not, that's not what my goal is. I also wanna know why. And so to do that, I'll ask about how people are feeling before they cut, and then what does it do for them? Does it help them feel more or less of a particular emotion? And then also how other people react and how kids feel about that reaction. And then finally, like how well does it work? Um, for the kids, like I mentioned, who are using kind of multiple methods, I'm usually not feeling like it's working that well. And those are actually kids that I worry about quite a bit. Um, and uh, there have been studies that show that kids who utilize multiple different forms of self-injury are at higher risk for suicide as well. So what do I do next? Well, the first thing um, I want to do is assess suicidality as well, because oftentimes self-harm is not a suicide attempt. In fact, the vast, vast, vast majority of times, kids who, you know, cut on their forearms and things like that are not trying to kill themselves. In fact, in many cases, you know, going back a little bit, um, what does it do for you? They'll say, well, I feel like I want to die. And when I cut myself, I no longer feel that way. That's an important thing. And I would say then um, just because they are suicidal and they cut does not make it a suicide attempt. In fact, they are using self-injury as kind of a coping skill in that instance. Um, then I want to figure out, OK, well, what are we supposed to treat? Um, because uh, remember, kids all very often have an underlying psychiatric illness if they engage in self-harm. There's no medication that can treat self-harm and make it go away. But there are medications that can treat comorbid disorders. And I think that's an important thing for um, uh, prescribers to be aware of. Again, I'm like wary of being a secret keeper. So for kids who are like actively self-harming, um, I'll often ask them, how are we gonna talk to your parents about this? Um, and we, and because I wanna figure it, to, figure it out together with the kid. And if a kid is telling me something, odds are pretty good that they know that I'm gonna have to tell their parents. Like if a kid is telling me that they're actively suicidal, um, there is no way that they don't know what the next steps are going to be. And so they may be very upset and say, oh, I can't believe you're telling my parents or something like that. Um, you know, I know in my mind, okay, you know, there's a reason that I'm hearing about this. Um, the other thing that I think is important to know about self-injury is therapy does help. There are treatments um, that can be really effective in addressing uh, self-injury that are not medications. So just to share a little bit about this, just to get a sense of you know, what are the aspects of uh, treatment that can be helpful? Um, the strongest uh, effect sizes are for a couple of different uh, types of therapy. Dialectical behavioral therapy is something people are very, very uh, aware of, but it's very hard to access in some cases. Um, it's a kind of treatment that's very much focused on teaching skills. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is much more common um, and accessible and available. Um, it's about addressing kind of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors directly. And then finally, mentalization-based therapy is uh, more linked to kind of older, more psychoanalytic um, uh, principles, but it's been shown to be really effective. Um, however, I should know that I have like not really encountered anyone in the state of Maryland that practices mentalization-based therapy. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, there are a lot of folks up in New York where it was... Uh, um, uh, th that are practicing it, but I, I would say not so much here. There are like key ingredients though. So if we hear about a particular therapy that, that one of our kids is in, engaged in, um, there are some things that we can uh, pay close attention to. Number one is their focus on family interactions. The family can be a huge source of additional stress and dysregulation that leads kids to want to engage in self-harm or in many cases also attempt suicide. But also the family can, can be a huge asset as well, helping to provide an environment where kids feel safe, helping to provide validation and self-soothing as well. Um, key ingredients in treatment also include frequent meetings, like once weekly, um, or in some cases even more often, and a real emphasis on self-care, um, in particular sobriety, sleep, and increasing positive experiences. Because remember, this is often associated with emotion uh, regulation challenges in the same way that suicidality can. And so if we're able to help uh, help kind of deal with this sort of underlying challenges or problems that uh, 
make it hard for us to regulate our emotions, like having a substance use challenge or not sleeping, um, then I think we can actually make uh, uh, things much easier for ourselves. Educating parents, I think, should be a huge uh, part of our, our job, too. Um, I do um, uh, think highly of this book in particular by Michael Hollander, who is um, a major uh, dialectical behavior therapy uh, trainer. Um, it's a book intended for lay audiences. It helps kind of explain the concepts and skills of DBT, but more than anything else, it just kind of helps parents understand why a kid might engage in some of these behaviors. And that helps parents respond, I think, in a way that's much more, um, much more helpful and uh, much more likely to be kind of validating as opposed to being really explosively reactive um, and at times kind of acting in a way to make things worse. So some take home points around self-harm, um, you know, cutting doesn't tell us everything about the diagnosis and most kids uh, uh, don't cut more than 10 times uh, in their lives. But we do know that uh, cutting is associated with future suicide attempts. Most kids will engage though to make a feeling go away and it's rarely done for attention. When we encounter a kid who engages in self-harm, we wanna figure out why they're doing it, what's the function of the behavior, identify comorbidities and also assess suicidality. And it's also important to know there are a bunch of treatments that can be helpful for them too. So, okay, so we've assessed everything, we've met our, we've assessed suicidality, we've assessed self-injury, and we feel like we don't need to have our kids are emergently evaluated in a psychiatric emergency setting and they can go home and, um, but you know, we want to engage in some safety planning with them. So I'll walk through how that works. So here's what we know about safety planning and, 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 and what to do. Um, the great news about this is there is an office or emergency room-based or school-based intervention that we have reason to believe can be helpful. Um, so just to be clear, though, there haven't been a ton of studies in um, uh, safety planning in pediatric populations in particular, but there have been more in kind of adult and young adult populations. And that's uh, kind of what uh, is a reason why we make use of it so much um, at Johns Hopkins in the emergency room on our consultation services as well, and why we teach it as part of BHIP. Uh, so this safety planning intervention plus a single phone check-in managed to uh, reduce six-month suicidal behaviors by 45% of adults who came to the ER with concerns for suicidality. That is like a hugely powerful intervention. And this intervention only took a short period of time to conduct. Another thing that's useful about these sorts of safety plans, and in particular this one, is it's often part of a more comprehensive treatment approach too. So if you're in DBT, you're often gonna be completing a safety plan like this. If you're in CBT, you'll be completing a safety plan like this. Every kid who is discharged from our inpatient unit and our day hospital complete a safety plan like this as well. And I'll go through it in some detail. So why do it? Um, not that I think uh, you all would need so much convincing, but that is because there is often a lag between a kid leaving your office or leaving the ED and either initiating mental health treatment or just like seeing their therapist kind of more regularly. We very rarely will have them go directly from our office directly to um, another provider. Um, this also uh, provides kids and families with a set of behaviors to pursue. And I think that's really important because we know that things like contracting for safety aren't real and they're not helpful. Um, anyone who uh, you know has young children or has worked with young children know it's a lot more helpful to say, I would like you to do this um, than to say, don't do that. Because if you say, don't do that, that means that every behavior is on the table except the one that you just mentioned. Whereas when you provide sort of positive behaviors to sort of aspire to engage in, you're much more likely to see them. And so this is useful also for addressing suicidal thoughts and self-injuries behaviors as well. So a couple of principles though, before you dive in, I think um, uh, with safety planning, the goal is to provide kids and families with a prioritized and specific set of strategies should suicidal or self-injurious thoughts emerge. The underlying philosophy is it sees suicidal and self-injurious crises as intense but temporary challenges. And so you'll be making a safety plan if you do it in close collaboration with the kid and also the family too. Um, and this is something that you can make a billion copies of and put it all over the home, in schools, wherever, um, such that uh, everybody can be on the same plan whenever there's a crisis. So here's what the uh, patient safety plan uh, looks like. It's uh, designed by uh, Brown and Stanley. 
Um, this website actually has sort of updated, it, basically a prettier version of the, the image that I have up on the screen, but this is also non-proprietary. It's free to use. Um, and the idea is to start with kind of step one and work your way to step six. Um, and step one is meant to be more kind of internal. And as you work your way through the safety plan, you move to more external uh, ways of reaching out for help. So just some other things to consider in working with kids. There also should be an associated plan for increased supervision from parents and also a check-in system as well. So the first step is to identify warning signs in particular. Um, how should either a kid or parents or other adults be able to notice that a kid is in crisis? So this is meant to emphasize uh, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that an adolescent can identify on their own, but also observable behaviors that other people can notice too. Some kids will say, I am in crisis when I'm clenching my fists and pacing or rocking back and forth. Other kids will just say, I noticed that a particular set of thoughts pop into my head, um, but we can't follow the safety plan unless we notice that we need to follow the safety plan. And that's why I think an emphasis on warning signs is so important. The next step is uh, focusing on internal coping strategies. And so it's an initial step. It's meant to uh, enhance self-efficacy. That is, these are meant to be things that the kid can do on their own. And they're often distraction techniques, going for a walk, taking a shower, things like that. DBT is all about like teaching different uh, coping skills. And so uh, there's a whole, we call it a module with many different skills just focused on distress tolerance and distraction. So just an example, and you can just honestly Google DBT distress tolerance, and you'll see different variations of, uh, or different ways in which these skills are presented. The important thing about step two is that these strategies should be usable like at any time by the individual as well. So step three is using social contact uh, to distract from suicidal thoughts. And it might be specific individuals that you could spend time with or talk to, or just like places where there are other people. And so this is not meant to be about kind of seeking out emotional support and kind of sharing what's going on, but rather just like being in a place where you can feel safe. And so these places may be private, potentially. Um, uh, it might be going for a walk in the woods with somebody, um, or it could just be public in the event that you're not able to identify a particular person. I just need to be around people because I know when I'm around people, I'm going to make better choices. Again, the aim is to focus on self-efficacy. The person that you're going for a walk with in the woods is not meant to be the person that you're spilling, um, you know, all the details of how you're feeling. It's just, I'd like to go for a walk and that's it. We're just distracting ourselves because again, the idea is we're in a temporary crisis. And one of the most important things we can do is just like let it pass with time. But let's say we've tried those things and it's not working. The next step is to actually reach out for help. That's to contact specific family members or friends who may help with the crisis. So just a couple of things that are important. Um, people should know that they're on this list. Uh, so you would wanna give them a heads up so that they're not kind of shocked or surprised. Um, and also we want these to be adults. I think it's not necessarily fair to ask another kid to kind of help somebody through a suicidal crisis. Um, they're they're not trained. And, uh, and also that is a really, really, a significant and weighty responsibility for an, another kid. Um, at this stage though, the crisis can be discussed openly. Sometimes all a kid needs is just validation and support and some time. Uh, in other cases, uh, you know, uh, they may need more than that, but uh, the goal is to just listen and validate. And then once uh, we've sort of done that, then we can start thinking about problem solving potentially. But if we go through that steps and, and the, the, the people in our lives, uh, friends or family are not able to help get us to the other side of it, that's when it's time to reach out to uh, mental health professionals or agencies. So ideally you would have the names of clinicians, but also you would wanna know the number for urgent care services as well. Um, and it also includes uh, a suicide prevention uh, a hotline number. At this stage, clinician involvement is definitely necessary. Um, you know, for outpatient providers too, we want to um, ensure that they're kind of aware of the situation as well. And that if there are particular kind of like crisis uh, numbers to call or uh, protocols to go through, that should be included in the safety plan as well. So uh, step six 
is to start kind of making sure that the house is safe. So I think this is a mix of step zero and step one. So like step zero is things that um, should be kind of universally applied to all kids. And in particular, that is like locking up firearms. We do know that firearms use in pediatric suicides come from the home nine out of 10 times. Um, and that uh, having owning a firearm was uh, uh, and suicide was twice as strong in adolescents uh, than adults. And we also know that uh, safe storage laws can uh, have been shown to reduce firearm uh, suicide as well. And that, you know, unfortunately about three in 10 households, uh, only three in 10 households actually follow the AAP recommendations for locking firearms as well. So I would say things like that are step zero. Um, step six though is more uh, kind of making, uh, um, you know, things like securing knives in the house that would be used for like making food and things like that. There are other things that might be step six, they might be step zero, kind of depending on uh, the kid. And that would be things like locking up medication as well. So there are additional considerations I think that we should be uh, thinking about specifically for kids. One is a uh, plan for increased supervision at home during a crisis. That can be, that can look all sorts of different ways. It can be limiting time left alone, increasing time spent with family, just like sitting on the couch watching movies together. Um, but parents should be explicit about this. It is not helpful to spy on your child um, as, a, as a means of providing additional supervision. I also think it's really important to devise a check-in system as well. And I, there should be limits on both ends. What that basically means is a lot of kids will say, oh yeah, sure, you can check in with me every week and I will you know, give a one kind of grunt or a different kind of grunt, depending on how I'm feeling with regards to my safety. Like that's not adequate. Likewise, many parents would like to check in every five minutes for the next six years, because really their goal is to alleviate their own anxiety rather than to make sure the situation is safe. So this is where we often have to like play referee a little bit. Um, I think it's fine to not do things explicitly kind of verbal. Some parents are really uncomfortable about asking explicitly about suicide and some kids are in safety and some kids are really uncomfortable uh, verbalizing the same. And so this is where coming with kind of a, a predetermined or, or sort of mutually agreed upon kind of vocabulary or system to check in around safety, I think can be really useful. A lot of times, you know, you'll use a color-coded chart. Are you in the red zone? Are you on the yellow zone? Are you in the green zone? That can be enough as long as everybody knows what the different zones mean. So in summary, you know, there are no firm guidelines for universal su uh, suicide screening in uh, youth pediatric visits, but, uh, but I think that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for suicide screening. Um, we can use a tool to help guide our assessment of suicidality. Um, but, you know, a positive screen is no substitute for really thorough assessment. And I think it, it's really important, though, that safety planning is really essential for kids who don't need an immediate higher level of care. So in these slides, I have a ton of different papers that I've referenced and things like that. Um, I'm, I imagine the slides will be available to you all, so you can feel free to, to check them out, uh, some on suicide and some on self-injury. But that wraps things up for me. Um, so we do have some time for questions. Um, and I see there's one in the Q&A right now. Um, so how do you recommend providers address parents who do not believe that suicidal thoughts are serious or downplay the situation? Um, often we have, uh, we have this in patients, uh, parents refuse to take the child for further evaluation. Um, oh man, so that's a really difficult uh, question. I think, you know, the nuclear option is, you know, we are mandated reporters. And so if, uh, if we feel that a kid is at imminent risk and parents aren't addressing a need, we are obligated then to uh, file a report on that kid's behalf to CPS. But again, that is the nuclear option. I think we want to usually avoid that at all costs. This is where I think a really thorough evaluation is helpful, though. Um, because I think we want to make sure that the parents understand the whole story as we hear it, and we can provide, hey, like these are the details, um, and this is this is why I think that the plan that was described by this kid actually is more worrisome than maybe what you've heard in the past or something like that. Um, again, I think uh, what's most important is uh, that everybody's on the same page around what the narrative is, and when that happens, we tend to feel 
a more equal amount of worried. Um, likewise, I think one of the questions is, what is the reason behind parents refusing to take their child for further evaluation? In some cases, it can be that parents have said, I went to the ER before, I waited seven days there, I was evaluated once, and my kid was discharged home eventually because no bed uh, showed up. So I think we need to understand what their concerns are too. And if that's the case, then we may need to come up with some sort of alternative arrangement. It may be, okay, then what I need you to do is call uh, your outpatient therapist, make an emergent appointment if at all possible. There are also like urgent care um, evaluation sites as well. Um, rather than going to the ER that can be evaluated. I think understanding what their concerns are because kids are, parents are worried about their kids, but oftentimes they're worried about other stuff too. So ideally fully understanding the story as well as, um, uh, as well as um, understanding parents' concerns is really the best way to approach. But again, we have this obligation um, as mandated reporters that, that we can't forget about too. And I think sometimes we have to share that with parents too. Like, look, this is this is my legal obligation. Um, and uh, so I don't want you to be surprised if you wind up hearing from somebody too. And then I think, you know, grudgingly, they may agree ultimately. Okay, so I see lots of, so I'm going through the chat to look for specific questions, but I can see the, the so what steps, um, would you advise for a younger student, 10 to 11, who is verbalizing thoughts of self-injurious behaviors uh, without a history plan or actions? Also, these verbal comments have emerged within the same peer group simultaneously with none having a previous history. That is super, super challenging. Um, and again, this is where I would wanna know like what, how are these behaviors like being reinforced? What is the function of these behaviors as well? Um, and again, you know, the history tells us roughly how worried we should be, but we got to take it seriously when a kid says something like that, too. I think the ultimate choice of intervention, um, we should be thinking a lot about how these sorts of uh, verbalizations are being reinforced. Like, let's say the kid's in the classroom and they say it out of frustration, they find that that means they get to leave a frustrating activity. Well, you know, that tells us something important about kind of how we should think about the behavior. But I think we got to go through all the same steps that you would evaluate a kid who's 14 or 15 too. And I think um, uh, that's really important as well. So um, I just think that usually with younger kids, especially if you're noticing something a little bit weird going on, um, we should be especially thoughtful of how is this be behavior being reinforced and how can we make sure that we're not accidentally positively reinforcing the behavior. Um, Okay. Um, so a uh, question from Samantha Galbraith. What should you do if you feel the child is on the edge of something serious, but they use vague language to describe it because they know the confidentiality rules? That's another really, really good question. I think this is where kind of our greater knowledge of the kid can be really helpful. What are the, you know, what are the risk factors that are associated uh, with it? Has this kid ever engaged in self-harm before? Is this a kid that you know very, very well? Or is this a kid that you just sort of barely know? I think, um, you know, we want to err on the side of caution. Um, and also make sure that we're able to verbalize that to parents too. Um, and um, and so, you know, if you're like, I'm just not getting the whole story, this isn't making a ton of sense. Um, I think that uh, um, in that case, you know, referring for an emergent evaluation makes sense. But it's also worth wondering, you know, why am I hearing just like a little bit of this story too? So I, I just think it's also really important for us always to be curious about why is our kid telling this story in this particular way? What goal do they have in mind? What are they hoping that I will hear? And what outcome are they hoping for as well? In some cases, a lot of uh, there's, you know, not to get too shrinky, but there is a concept called projective identification where many adults and kids who are struggling to tolerate a feeling need to kind of share that feeling uh, with us so that we can feel it with them. And those are often the cases where we hear vague stories, where we just feel really uncomfortable, where a kid seems really calm, uh, but we're the one doing all their worrying, uh, all the worrying kind of on their behalf, basically. Those are the times where I wouldn't hesitate to, again, just kind of err on the side of caution there and make sure that that kid is evaluated in a place that's a little bit more safe. And then if there's ambiguity, you know, a little bit of time will hopefully allow that ambiguity to be sorted out. Um, 
There's a question, uh, is there uh, any research that reflects a strong connection between suicidality um, or non-suicidal self-harm and past, present, or future events, and which is most prevalent? I want to make sure that I understand that question um, exactly. So, and past, present, and future events. Um, so I, I don't know if it's referring to like uh, trauma, for instance, and we do know that uh, kids who engage in self-harm uh, do have a, a significantly higher um, uh, uh, rates of experiencing trauma. I think we can understand that a lot of different ways. Kids who experience trauma experience a lot of trauma-related symptoms, um, and so self-harm can help alleviate that. And we also know that young kids who experience trauma are also um, more likely to experience or to struggle with emotion regulation as well. So it's uh, it, it can kind of work in, in multiple different ways. So I hope that sort of answers the question, but you can feel free to, to retype if, uh, uh, if it's not adequate or if somebody has a different interpretation of it. Um, this is something about, so does it break down whether the trauma is ongoing or a past event? Oh, so, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that, but we can sort of speculate um, in a couple of different ways. Um, I would say, so when trauma is ongoing, I think that's sometimes when we want to think about um, how, what role is the self, what is the role of the self-entry? So, so just as an example, I've encountered kids who utilize self-entry um, because they're hoping to actually get out of a situation. The home environment is abusive, for instance. I'm going to engage in self-injury and have people notice it, and then hopefully that will land me in the hospital or something like that. This is just kind of an example, but this is where we can, again, think about how is this behavior being reinforced. Um, and, and so at, at times, self-injury very much can be kind of an escape behavior. And the same thing can be with kind of suicidality or expression of suicidality as well. Um, so that's when there's kind of ongoing trauma. I think past trauma, that's uh, more related to this idea of, um, uh, you know, uh, emotion regulation challenges and, and self-harm being utilized to kind of help manage those, uh, those kind of sequelae, because those feelings are really, really challenging to deal with. You know, it's hard enough being an adolescent, and if you've had life experiences that sort of turn up the volume of adolescence, um, you know, you can imagine it's, it's that much harder. Trying to see if there are other questions that are here. Looks like we have another one in the Q and A. Oh, okay. Asking to see scars. What if they refuse to show you? I try to get a nurse involved to make sure nothing is infected, etc. Um, I took a few. Uh, a I took a course a few years ago, and the presenter had said that asking to see scars can be tricky. Like it is theirs and you can't see it. So it's a really good question. And honestly, one thing that I'm continually, I, I've been doing this for a while. Like before I was a, a psychiatrist, I actually worked at a place called Three East at McLean Hospital, which worked, um, which was a residential DBT program. So it was a lot of kids who had really serious kind of refractory to treatment self-harm. And um, I can think of maybe once or twice where someone has refused when I've asked. Um, and uh I will say um, a rule that I generally have in dealing with kids is don't pick a fight that you can't win. So if they're not willing to show me scars, I, I think that's that's okay. I want to live to fight another day, but I'm curious as to why not. I mean, in some cases, I won't ask. Let me rephrase that. Sometimes I won't ask to see them because of where they're located, um, uh, because that's you know obviously like not going to be appropriate, even if somebody was there chaperoning. But for instance, for somebody who has scars, on their forearms or like their lower legs or shoulders or, or things like that. I think it's uh, much less, it's much less tricky. And I, I, I don't typically encounter someone who's, who's unwilling to, to show me, but again, I should have been more specific around, like there are certain circumstances where, you know, I will take people's word for it because I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to, to, you know, uh, cross a boundary. I think we have another question in the chat. Um, okay, so purging was listed as a type of self-harm, but never directly mentioned eating disorders. Um, is that what is being referred to? Is it more of a coping mechanism to some stress or not specifically weight? So that's a really good question. Um, 
I, I guess not to open up a huge can of worms, um, mm. I, I think of anorexia nervosa and bulimia as being like wildly different uh, types of conditions. Um, and oftentimes when you hear kids with bulimia describe uh, their you know, stories around kind of uh, purging after a meal or something like that, um, it is very, very analogous to, um, to what kids will describe when they engage in self-injury as well. So I, I'm not speaking kind of like broadly about eating disorders, but more the specific behavior of purging, because often it's very clearly tied to like this feeling of relief that is very similar to what a, a lot of kids will describe when they engage in self-harm. Um, the other thing about purging, uh, just as relates to, you know, uh, weight specifically is, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, purging is not an effective way to, uh, lose weight. Uh, even, you know, disordered kind of purging it messes up your electrolytes, messes up your teeth. You feel better because you have this in, often immense sense of guilt associated with eating. Um, but I would say purging, um, in my experience is much more of, about a, using it to kind of cope with feelings that are really challenging to manage then. Um, and, it, and those feelings may be tied to weight, but it's not kind of a weight management strategy. Okay. I think that's all of our questions for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Kronzberg, for a wonderful presentation and to all of our participants in today's session. The recording for today's session, the slides, and a list of related resources will be available on our website next week. We will send CME and CEU certificates to participants by March 29th. And please remember to take that survey as you exit. Is this required if you'd like to receive a CME or CEU certificate? And we'll send that out via email as well. And stay tuned for future BF trainings by following us on social media. And thank you again. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.